Okay, well, listen, thanks very much, and hopefully I'll, I'll survive the session with all you surgeons here. Um, so uh, this year uh, I've sort of branched out because uh, I think David gives such an amazing talk. There is nothing else to say about the data. And, uh, uh, you know, I think I did a previous session here where I showed four or five uh, gray cases, and it turned out that David chose angioplasty for all of them. So he's a sensible guy as well as knowing the data because I chose those cases specifically. So uh, there's no doubt in my mind that if I had a tight proximal LAD lesion that was a bit on the longer side, I'm going to have a lemur. Of course I am. Okay, there's no doubt in my mind. The stent will always carry a small risk. But there's also no doubt in my mind that if I actually was in the middle of having you know, my third wife and I needed a, so young kids, I don't have the time to have a lemur, I'm going to have a stent. So it's going to be a patient choice, whatever the data is. And we all know that actually one of the biggest dominant factors of what the patient chooses is what's going on around them. Some of them read the data, some of them don't read the data. And whatever I say to them, they make a choice based on what their philosophy is of life. And, you know, I deal a lot with Tavi these days. However much we say, look, you're 70 and you could have either, but at 70, I think surgery is better. If they've decided in their brain they're going to have a TAVI, they're going to have a TAVI. Yeah? And so uh, there's not much persuading them otherwise. And you argue about the you know, two-year data, the five-year data. It makes no difference to the patient whatsoever. And so I think we have to calibrate the data from the randomized trials, 10% of the patients we deal with, the 90% of patients that we actually have to conjecture and go beyond the evidence base and make a decision on. So the, the first case uh, is a gentleman who's got absolutely no symptoms whatsoever. Okay, so the starting point is no symptoms. Okay, however much you beat him to get a symptom out from you will not, he has no symptoms. So how did he get there? He's 64, perfectly well, slightly overweight, but no major risk factors except for his mate who was slightly overweight and drop down dead all of a sudden of a heart attack. Now at 64, if your friend dies of a heart attack, especially in front of you, you get a bit nervous about what's gonna happen next, okay? And so you go and see a cardiologist, okay? So uh, no symptoms at all. And I'll talk about the coronary disease in a second. So of course, you know, he's a little bit overweight, he's got a little bit of blood pressure, he's got a little bit of cholesterol. Uh, there was a question mark about a PE during an episode of COVID that was never proven. And always when you get this history in a dim and distant past from another hospital, question is, did you get anticoagulation? No. Okay, so that was a question mark that was in his head, but clearly no one thought it very likely because he didn't get anticoagulated even with COVID. Uh, and he's had his HP eradicated because there's a Vogue isn't there to eradicate helicobacter pylori. Don't know whether it does anything, but that's what the Vogue is for. So his ECG, asymptomatic, right bundle with first degree heart block. So you go, oh, that's uh, un interesting. His echocardiogram uh, actually showed that he's got a bit of a leak on a mitral valve, probably could leave that alone. But unbeknown to him, he's got a bit of hypokinesia in his infralateral wall. So all those of a certain age in the audience, you wonder what your echo and your ECG might show now, don't you? Because he has no symptoms whatsoever, and he only got tested because his mate dropped down. Uh, his LP little A is a little bit up. His total cholesterol was actually 7.3, yeah? And all this hyperlipidemia hypertension is only because he went to see the cardiologist. He was sitting there living a merry life, thinking he was absolutely fine. So he has a CT coronary angiogram because I think, uh, you know, and I would, this is not my patient, I, I would have done that as well. You know, I think it's a good way of calibrating where we are at. You've got lots of risk factors. Your mate dropped down dead. Okay, what are you sitting on? Are you sitting on a time bomb or not? Before CT became very vogue, then we used to do lots of stress tests, which are about 80% sensitive, or go straight to an invasive angiogram, which has a small risk of killing you as well. So a CT scan is a good way of actually calibrating where we're at. Second, he's got severe right disease, a severe intermediate disease, uh, moderate LA disease on the CT scan, okay? And severe distal disease. Now, those who know about CT scans know they overcall. That's what they're designed to do, okay? They're designed not to miss anything. So they're going to overcall it. So what was severe on the CT scan might be rather moderate on an angiogram, okay? This is not gonna be a normal invasive angiogram. That's definitely not gonna happen, but whether it's quite as severe as this says, who knows. But he was in the hands of one of my colleagues who is a non-invasive cardiologist. Okay, so he had an MRI scan. Okay, and an ischemia test is not a bad idea. We've ruled out left main stem disease. There's a question about the LAD. And so why not do an ischemia test to find out what's going on? An MRI scan is useful because it also shows the infarction that he's had without any symptoms whatsoever. Okay, so he's had an infarct probably in the intermediate territory. His ejection fraction is just a little bit below par. And the MRI scan shows ischemia in the right coronary artery territory, not the LAD. 
Now, you have to understand something about stress tests. If you've got a very tight narrowing and a more moderate narrowing, the stress test is going to light up bright as a beacon on the very tight narrowing. And you may not be able to see what's happening in the more moderate because your eye is drawn to the action that was happening with the tight narrowing. So although he's an MRI doctor, this chap uh, who did this investigation says, oh, there was definitely no LAD ischemia, I'm a bit more calibrated to say that's not 100% certain because you're going to be focusing very much as the ischemia starts on the right territory. You might miss the LAD. He's got a bit of hypertension. Okay, so question number one for the MDT. He's your brother. What's happening next? So uh, medical therapy, because you could argue he's got no proximal LAD disease on the MRI scan. Uh, the CT scan showed only moderate LAD. So on the, on, the C, on the angiogram, you might argue that it was going to be mild. So maybe it's not prognostic. Okay. So why are we doing it? He's got no symptoms. There's a one in a thousand probably risk of doing something during the angiogram that would be naughty. I've certainly given someone a stroke during a diagnostic angiogram. Uh, they couldn't speak for about six months. And one of my colleagues certainly has had a death during an angiogram because the left may stem dissected. So an invasive angiogram is not without risk, okay? But my feeling would be that an angiogram really is a must do, especially because I'm also worried about whether the proximal LED is really fine. If that proximal LED had shown on the CT scan as nothing, you could easily argue they should go for maximum medical therapy. You know, he's, got, yeah, he's got some right coronary ischemia, but we don't revascularize for prognostic reasons in that regard. But there could be a possibility of a proximal LAD. Okay. Um, so what did I say? And it's very important to know what the patient is going to expect before you do the angiogram. Okay. So it could be that it's just as the CT scan said. Okay, and that the LED is not very bad, the right coronary artery is really pretty poor, so do I want to already proceed on to stenting the right coronary artery because this man does not have symptoms, he's active, he's rushing about, he's doing exercise. Would it be safer for him to have an open right coronary artery without ischemia, okay, or just leave it alone on medical therapy? Okay, or is the CT scan, okay, slightly underplaying the situation and the LAD and the right coronary artery are bad? We know the intermediate might be bad. Then what am I going to do? Okay, and I told him that I am actually probably not going to rush to do anything at that stage. I'm going to stop because if you need a lemur to the LAD, as David's told you, then you're probably going to have a good prognostic advantage. I'm not changing your symptoms. You haven't got any. Okay, so I can only be about prognosis and then you should stop. Okay, and I quote him a risk of complications because I'm going to do a pressure wire and all the rest. Okay, so here's the angiogram. And I'll let uh, you think about this angiogram. There's quite a few views. Okay, so uh, let's try the pointer. Oh, okay, so we want to focus on the left main stem and we want to focus on the spider view, if I can move it across, on the LAD, which is sort of hovering about there, okay, in the spider view and a tight intermediate stenosis. If you've had enough of that, we'll move on. Okay, that view doesn't really help us a great deal, so we'll look at the areocranial. And you can see that the LAD is a bit on the curvy side, isn't it? And actually looks to have a moderate looking narrowing in there. Okay, so looking, at, looking a bit more than moderate on the next angiogram. Okay, so that's obviously not my angioplasty wire, because I already told you I wasn't going to angioplasty straight away, but it is a pressure wire because the MRI says no ischemia. We've got an invasive tool in the lab where we can assess whether this is a significant stenosis or not. Okay, so uh, the reading of the angiogram in my mind is that the LAD looks a bit dodge, the intermediate is very tight, and we haven't seen the right yet. And so even if, even if the LAD had not been significant, I'm not going to be stenting this right coronary artery. Okay, because this is not a slam dunk one stent. This is a very twisty, long stenosis. And I could easily give him an infarction while I'm doing this angioplasty in someone with no symptoms where we're speculating his, his prognosis will get better because the right is open. So this right coronary artery is not one where I'm rushing to put stents in to improve him because I could easily make him a lot, lot worse. So the right already is, I think, a no in an asymptomatic patient with no medical therapy really in tackling but the question is about the LAD. So for those who sort of don't fully understand physiology, then uh, the, um, the binary cutoff for IFR, which is what we invented at the Hammersmith, is 0 0.9. But there's no black and white in medicine. Okay, so if it's below 0 0.87, you're much more thinking it's significant. This was 0 0.86. For FFR, it's a different number. 
When it first was invented, it was 0 0.75, and then a gray zone occurred between 0 0.75 and 0 0.8, but 0 0.74 is definitely positive from all of the data, all significant LAD. And the intermediate, I agree with you, I didn't bother to do anything to that. That's pinhole tight, okay? And whether it was significant or not, if it was gonna have surgery, you'd graft it, okay? And if it wasn't gonna have surgery, I wouldn't be rushing to stent what is a side problem. So we've got LAD ischemia proven on the invasive test despite the MRI scan. We've got our right coronary ischemia proven on the MRI scan. We've got a small infarction in the intermediate territory, okay? So what are we going to do? Is it PCI to the right, PCI to the LAD, cabbage to the right, the LAD, and plus or minus the intermediate? Over to the panel. And what would push me to revascularize this man is he's 64, so an anticipated life expectancy if he gets the right treatment, 15, 20 years. Mm. I would do two mammary arteries. I would also almost certainly do the intermediate as well. And for the right, it's such a big, large, ectatic vessel. I think the only thing you could put on that is a vein graft. So that would be my strategy. Okay. okay. All right. So we're all agreed on grafts. Is anyone not wanting to graft? If you're a surgical audience. Uh, you're going to have to be sacked, aren't you, if you don't say bye for <laughs> surgery. So, uh, okay. So uh, there's surgery. I mean, okay, there is the option of medical therapy, obviously. Uh, and so, uh, and the patient really didn't want too much done. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll find out what the patient wants, okay? He uh, doesn't really want much done, okay? Remember, he's come to get advice because his friend dropped down dead. But of course, if you get the wrong advice, if I tell you you've got to lose weight, stop smoking, and go to the gym 10 times a week, you might ignore that advice. Yeah? So, uh, so that's what patients are like. Okay, so he wasn't keen on having anything done. So I said to the referring cardiologist, look, he thinks he's functionally completely unlimited. But we have a way of testing that. He's also got right bundle, so the ECG on its own is going to be a load of rubbish, isn't it? So we're not going to do a standard exercise test. So why don't you do a cardiopulmonary exercise test, really put him through his paces, and we'll prove that he's not normal, and then we can tell him what to do, okay? And of course, he turns out to have pretty normal exercise physiology. The blood pressure response is a bit blunted, okay? But he has got normal peak exercise capacity, normal anaerobic threshold, the EC didn't change one iota, he got no symptoms. And now what? <laughs> Make your choice. So what's the panel feeling like now? How much are we gonna twist this man's arm? I mean, at the end of the day, he came to you or another cardiologist yeah. because he's worried. Yeah. You give the findings, suggest the treatment, it's up to the end of the day, patient's choice. No arm twisting. David, come on, you like to be robust. Yeah, I am, I'm not too concerned about what a patient chooses. What I'm very concerned about is that they're given the appropriate information. Mm. And I think it's why it's very important that patients are discussed at the multidisciplinary team meeting. An agreement is made at that meeting as to what people think the patient should be recommended. Whether the patient accepts it or not is a totally different issue. So at this point in time, on the basis of the angiogram, I would say to this man, I mean, and, and, and what I'd like to say is your case has been discussed at a heart team meeting by a group of experts, and they think this is the best option for you. And the patient says, I don't want it, fine. Mm. And if this patient was 84, I might take a different view. Yeah. But I'm very influenced by the fact he's 64, mm. and, and he's got severe multivessel disease, and we know from the syntax, as I showed you, these are the patients who over five, even at five years, have a seven to nine percent difference in mortality if you're in the intermediate or high risk group. So I would take this into consideration. I'd tell them what the results showed, but, I, but the, in my recommendation to them just now would still be bypass surgery. We've done uh, two angioplasty studies back to back at the Hammersmith. Okay, the first one became world famous orbiter, okay, and made one of our cardiologists very famous, okay, um, with a very small group of patients. Completely blinded the patient and the uh, referring team on what the treatment was. The amount of uh, exercise change was very limited, about 10 seconds, from having a very good stent to an artery that was definitely ischemic. The change in symptom burden very marginal compared to medical therapy, okay? So then we did another study where we did bicycle exercise testing on the table, but unblinded, obviously. So we do the exercise test and we do the stent, 
And we say to the patient, what a fantastic result that stent is. Look at that, it's wide open, drain pipe. And then we repeat the exercise test, much better results. So that actually brings me back to what one of my oldest sort of friends, cardiologist, Dr. Rodney Fole did, which was always take the time to show the patient the amazing result. Even if the result wasn't amazing, he said, what an amazing result that is. And the patient will go, that's amazing, doctor, thank you so much. And he actually makes you feel better. So the power of the placebo, or the power of the charm of the doctor or the surgeon, okay, is actually very, very important. So showing them the angiogram, I think, is a very good idea. This person went to an MDT, okay, mixed MDT, cardiologists, cardiac surgeons, they also said surgery, okay? So he knows that, okay, He's, he knows that. So. He's still saying no. And on top of that, what makes me nervous is that he's on his aspirin, he's on his statin. ACE inhibitors have prognostic advantage in coronary artery disease. He got a bit dizzy, okay? He hasn't been tried on a beta blocker, so he'll remain ischemic on exercise come what may. And we're now gonna follow him up. Well, the other cardio is gonna follow him up. Thankfully, not my patient, because I'm sitting there quite nervous about this chap and what's going to happen in five years' time. But, you know, the patient's made his choice. He came to get advice. He's had the advice, and he's sort of slightly gone against the advice and said, okay, I'll take the statin and the you know, and maybe I'll get better. There's the occasional patient where the MRI testing, if you, if you stress them again and again, it becomes negative if they've had a really dramatic change in lifestyle, because I think their microvasculature gets better. And so there is one small chance that is because... He's in the hands of a non-invasive cardiologist, so he would definitely get another stress MRI scan in six months' time. It would be very interesting to see. If it becomes completely negative with high-dose statins and all the rest, okay, maybe he made the right choice. But my guess is that he'll be back for some more attention a little bit later. I think I'll probably be repeating his angiogram in a couple of years' time, and then he's going to end up with the surgery. Okay, so that was case one. Any questions about case one? Yes.